Good evening, everyone. I do hope all of you are safe and healthy. Thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Seema Menon, and I'm the director of CFO India, a leading media platform focused at engaging the CFO community in India. As they say, every crisis is an opportunity for introspection, both at the personal level and for businesses. And a global crisis such as this is forcing businesses to relook at their business models, supply chain, customer acquisition, and retention. And what will be pivotal to all of this transformation is certainly technology. Having said that, organizations also find themselves needing to adjust their spend to weather the storm and create a financial buffer for the long haul. As CFOs, I'm sure uh, your first priority in this crisis is to be able to conserve cash. So in such a scenario, the potential benefits of a consumption-based IT model are attracting interests across a range of business sectors. So I welcome you all to this webinar. So before we get started, I wanted all of you to quickly get acquainted to this platform. We're using the Zoom platform and uh, you know, we will have a couple of polls that come up during the course of the interaction. So the polls will appear in the poll window and you will be given 30 seconds to respond to these polls. So we have a couple of polls that are coming up uh, during the course. Uh, you will also find a Q&A window at the bottom. Uh, so you can type in your queries, etc. cetera. A panelist can actually view these queries and respond. I will also take up the questions at the end of the uh, interaction. So I'm deeply delighted to welcome four, three of our subject matter experts, Devendra Tanija, who's the CEO and Managing Director for PC Solutions, Anurag Gupta, who's the worldwide Green Lake sales leader for HPE, uh, Professor Raghu Ayer, who's a chartered accountant and an adjunct professor at various management institutes. They will talk to us about why the need of the hour is to overall IT capability to ensure greater emphasis on creating agility, collaboration, and enabling innovation with a clear interface between IT supply and business demand. So before we get started, we just wanted to quickly gauge uh, the audience sentiment around the topic for today. So you will have the first poll coming up and I will sort of just display it on the screen as well. You have 30 seconds. So please respond to these polls. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just sharing the first poll responses. So almost about 44% say that, you know, they've, they've considered adopting uh, as a service solutions in their organization. Almost an equal amount says that they don't have any in place. So I think there's a huge opportunity for each one of us to understand the mechanics of it and uh, how do we go about implementing these. Okay, I will move on to my next poll question. I'll read it out and then the options will come on your screen. What are your top reasons for adopting an as solution? So the 44% who told us that they looked at uh, as solutions in their organizations, please let us know what were the motivators. I think this is also a very interesting insight because about 44% said that, you know, access to new technologies and cost saving on overheads were the two motivators for them to look at uh, as a service uh, solutions. Okay, we'll move on to the third poll. And after that, we'll move on to, uh, to our uh, speakers for today. I'm just going to read it out. What are the th top three benefits you hope to derive from uh, as solutions? So I'm just going to launch it. There are a couple of options. Please do key in your responses. Okay, almost 90% say that CapEx savings is one of the key benefits that they're looking to derive. And obviously IT resource savings comes second and availability comes the third. Okay, so thank you so much for your insights because I'm sure you know our speakers for today are gonna to touch upon some of these aspects and uh, talk a little bit about uh, how some of these solutions are making a difference uh, to the overall IT uh, paradigm within organizations. Okay, now without any further delay, let me get on to uh, uh, Mr. Kanija to walk us through his part, and then we will move on to the other speakers. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ima. Good evening, and very warm welcome to all the participants on behalf of Peace Solutions and Havelock Record Enterprises. 
I am Devendra Taneja, founder and CEO of PC Solutions. PC Solutions is a 32-year-old organization. We specialize in helping our customer transforming uh, their businesses to digital platform and optimizing business benefits in every which way possible. <clears throat> we engage with our customers right from conceptualization stage, platform, uh, customize it, implement it, and take the responsibility of running it through full process cycle to get the maximum benefit out of the project. With more than 750 professionals and worked with 650 and more customers over 2000 plus project, we have a very rich pool of resources of every kind of complex project and technology implementation that any size of organization, largest to medium size, looks for implementing in today's area. As, as an organization, we are compliant and certified to all, uh, all the international standards of IT domain, it be that information security, quality management, app development, IT services management. Not only that, uh, PC Solution is CRISL, which is a credit rating agency, uh, rated SME1, which is the highest rating for our domain. Uh, and here is, uh, as I said, we have implemented more than 2,000 projects. Here is a, a global map where on-site or off-site over last one decade, PC Solution has implemented and rolled out multiple projects for many of our customers in their data center and business transformation. Specific areas where we specialize are in the cloud solution and services, app and software development, uh, data security and uh, uh, theft prevention, uh, data prevention, plus uh, infrastructure management services. We have a large pool of resources which, which help our customers take care of different domain of their IT infrastructure, be that data consolidation, network routing, uh, complete uh, solution, build data center, software or app development, services uh, of any kind, either through remote or through on-site uh, help and support. Next slide. Here is a presentation of uh, recognition and rewards that which P Solution has got from many uh, or almost every brand of owner of technology domain and media space. Uh, not only Havlet Packard, we solution is uh, extended and deep high uh, ranking partner for almost every leading uh, technology, technology brand owner to smoothly implement a multi product, a multi complexity solution uh, in, in data center of any size. Next, please. And here is a brief uh, snapshot of some of our very happy and satisfied customers for whom we have helped them through uh, their data transformation journey. To a digital platform. Yeah, it was around uh, later part of March 2020 when all of a sudden uh, many of our customers realized that COVID-19 is posing enormous challenges in their in their business operation, in their technology domain, and financial activities as well, because it happened all of a sudden and so swift. They started engaging with our, our teams to find immediate solution for business continuity. And they started revisiting their long-term strategy for IT deployment in their organization for business continuity, growth, cost cutting from whichever dimension it was meaningful for them to have. And that's where uh, learning from these, we realized that Avalet Records Green Lake solution is finding a very meaningful tool for a lot of organization to achieve this objective which is what was the idea behind getting this webinar together with domain expert from Tablet Packard, Mr. Anurag Gupta, who has global exposure of running Green Lake solution of, of multiple sizes and scale from the largest to the mid size, as well as who would take us through a, a structuring of, a, a, of the Green Lake solution from technical and a contractual point of view. Plus we have Professor Raghu Ayer, who is a veteran and authority in his own right in financial domain and brings in uh, his neutral perspective, having worked with all sides of organization in finance as to how does it make sense for this elite group of uh, participants today. Over to you, Anurag, all the best. Thank you, Mr. Thanija, and welcome.
welcome everybody to this uh, session on consumption, uh, IT consumption. So uh, a brief introduction about myself. Uh, you know, I started this business for Hewlett Packard Enterprise India about six years ago. And over the past six years, uh, you know, we've built up this business, uh, uh, you know, into multiple verticals and for multiple customers across the world. Uh, kind of very rapidly adopt this model, uh, you know, where... <clears throat> You know, they kind of found a lot of benefit uh, coming out of this uh, model for, uh, you know, all the kind of initiatives that they had. And, uh, you know, we call this model the Green Lake model, okay, uh, where we discuss about deploying infrastructure within your premise. Uh, now, by definition, premise means any equipment that is dedicated to you. Uh, you know, where, you know, the utilization of that infrastructure is 100% uh, only for your uh, use, usage, for your organization usage. But along with that, GreenLake also recognizes the fact that, you know, a lot of our customers are also considering or have moved into a cloud journey. So as part of the GreenLake deployment, apart from the infrastructure deployed within your data center, we also, uh, you know, have tied up with, uh, you know, the, uh, the main cloud, pr public cloud providers like like Microsoft Azure or uh, AWS or Google Cloud. Okay, so what we intend and provide uh, in this model is an end-to-end -end infrastructure where you know, depending on how much capacity you want within your infrastructure, in, within your premise, which is 100% dedicated equipment, or you know, whatever equipment you need, uh, you know, in the public cloud through one single contract, we can provide you an end-to-end, -end, uh, you know, view of your estate. So why does somebody want to look at that kind of thing, especially uh, you know, in the COVID and the post? COVID uh, kind of era, okay? So one of the important things that is identified is that, you know, uh, you have a lot of, uh, you know, IT resources available uh, probably within your organization who are very, very good, uh, you know, with knowledge about your business, with the way your operations run and so on. And, you know, you want to be able to kind of leverage that resource, uh, you know, your best resources to focus on on, on aligning your, your business and IT so that IT can contribute in the best possible manner for your business, which is kind of freeing up these resources, IT resources or savings on these IT resources as they focus on innovation, okay? And which I also saw as per the poll, uh, you know, one of the top three benefits. Now, when we look at customers across the world, okay, a lot of these customers have already moved apps that could move to the cloud uh, into the cloud. For example, you know, your Office 365, okay? A couple of years ago, a lot of uh, organizations used to run these huge Microsoft Exchange servers and so on. But over the last couple of years, especially, a lot of that has moved into the public cloud, okay? Um, you know, as what is commonly called the software as a service model, okay? So similarly, you know, whatever, you know, those cloud native applications or, you know, any new development that's happening, anything that requires, uh, you know, a constant integration with business, some of those, uh, you know, workloads have already moved into the cloud. But the interesting thing as per IDC is that about two thirds of the workload would continue to remain on premise. And there are various reasons for that, you know, from a compliance perspective or control, uh, you know, data, you know, everyone says the new gold. Okay. So, you know, if your data is exposed, it's lying in somebody else's infrastructure, uh, which you may or may not have tomorrow, then that could be a concern. So security, the sovereignty of the data, uh, sometimes performance and interdependency on other systems as you kind of, uh, you know, launch solutions which your customers can consume very easily. Okay. So uh, what we are seeing uh, across the world is that, you know, the IT organization is evolving into a very complex kind of dual uh, you know, operating environment where there's a team of people who are focusing on cloud and there's a team of people who are kind of taking care of all the infrastructure that you already have deployed within your, inf uh, within your data center or in a dedicated manner uh, for you. Okay? So what the GreenLake vision is, is the cloud experience everywhere. Okay? So whether it is on the edge where you have your IoT or you know, uh, your devices sitting in the field, maybe a handheld or mobile device, maybe an IoT, uh, sensor sitting on the shop floor. So wherever that uh, data is getting generated, okay, 
to uh, you know your data center where probably that data you know there may be some uh, processing on the edge there may be some processing within the data center maybe only uh, you know as the systems get smarter uh, you know the metadata comes into the data center and finally you know for the workloads which are very transient uh, which are not for a very long term or you know things that uh, you know may get a little more efficiency than move them into the cloud so our journey our vision for green lake is from the edge to the cloud everything that will be required by uh, both the end user as well the IT uh, organization so when I say end user it is where you know uh, let's say a user in one of the departments wants to access some IT capacity now the traditional model used to be I'll buy some infrastructure you know that person will get into IT IT would provision that resource all of those things are changing very very rapidly where the user can just go on to a self-service portal uh, ask for those resources and that resource is provided to him either instantaneously or through an approval workflow depending on how that organization's deployed it of course all of this uh, you know needs to be on a pay-per-use basis so a huge amount of efficiency on the capex you know capex savings is one of the top three benefits all of you mentioned so this is absolutely designed to help you know achieve those capex savings and uh, you know bring in the agility that you know uh, people are kind of used to when they look at cloud in terms of scale up or scale down whether that equipment is in the edge whether it is in the data center whether it's dedicated to you or it is a shared infrastructure provided in some public cloud Okay, and the basic thing here is in terms of your IT resource savings, okay, the entire solution needs to be managed for you and not by multiple parties so that there are multiple points of failure, but a single party like HPE or a partner of HPEs like PC Solutions, okay, where we bring the entire end-to-end -end solution to you, uh, you know, and then you don't need to bother about, you know, where it's placed, how it's being managed, you know, all of that is done for you. Your best resources then can focus on innovation. Okay, so, uh, you know, the way we look at this whole model is that, uh, you know, you can choose from a variety of services depending on the kind of workloads. And an example of workload would be like your SAP HANA application or maybe some legacy other applications that you may have, uh, you know, so there could be various kinds of workloads that you would deploy to kind of operate and manage your business in the most efficient manner okay and of course uh, you know it is always on a paper use basis which means depending on how much you consume uh, the bill for the next month will be generated accordingly okay a basic tenant of the whole model is to ensure that you always have capacity ahead of demand so you know there shouldn't be a situation where you know you have uh, some urgent uh, you know new project that you want to take on but you're not able to do that because you don't have the IT capacity you kind of got, can't every time go through a budgeting cycle and things like that and you know at the end of it uh, you know the end to end whether you know from the edge to the cloud all of that managed for you okay so that's the basic idea of green lake okay we kind of deploy a lot of infrastructure across the world uh, and you know basis that uh, we have seen something like 30 percent between 18 to 30 percent savings on capex and primarily uh, due to two reasons one is in terms of saving uh, due to kind of eliminating of excess capacity so you know normally when you buy equipment in a purchase model or what's commonly referred to as a capex model okay typically there would be some headroom sitting over there you have your month end processes your quarter end or year end processes and you always need to maintain some headroom but the fact that green lake is on a paper use model ensures that you know you don't have to over provision equipment and at the same time you don't have to pay for something that you're not using okay so uh, by deploying those kind of uh, technologies and tools and methodologies we are able to show between 18 to 30 percent and this is not just for large enterprises but also at SMB also in public sector and government we've been able to demonstrate this in other parts of the world as also in India okay uh, roughly about 65% saving in terms of deploying a global digital project okay this is something that we kind of have uh, you know two of our consultants for the Forrester consulting and IDC uh, you know commission to uh, you know run a survey with our customers and this is this data is based on that of course uh, you know a lot of savings in terms of you know increased IT productivity which uh, you know directly results in IT resource saving okay so those are the kind of benefits that have been documented by some of these leading uh, consultants who were commissioned by HP now, now the kind of workloads <coughs> 
that we show, uh, you know, with the Green Lake model, okay, are things like, uh, you know, any of your new initiatives that you may have, like your big data or, you know, uh, you know, AI and, you know, those kind of workloads where you're trying to kind of harness the data that is being generated or the huge amounts of data that is getting, getting generated across your various systems, irrespective of where, wherever they sit, or, you know, those traditional ERP or, you know, SAP HANA or, you know, those kind of workloads. It could also include, uh, you know, the public cloud. Cloud. So, like I mentioned in GreenLake model, both public and private cloud are possibilities. A lot of customers have started moving from virtualization into containerization so that they can seamlessly move workloads from on-prem to off-prem, off-prem to on-prem and so on, depending on, you know, the situation. So, given the COVID times and the uncertainties, okay, you want to be in a situation where you can quickly control OPEX. Okay, so anything obviously sitting in the public cloud would be in an OPEX model. You neither have, uh, you know, the right to control it, nor is there an identified asset. So, you know, with the AS19 lease definition or accounting uh, rules definition, which you are all aware of, okay, you can very quickly look at, you know, moving the transitioning those workloads from off-prem to on-prem. So containerization is a big move, uh, you know, especially organizations which in the past were not very sure have started looking at that. Of course, a lot of you are looking at your uh, workforce working from home so vdi solutions where you know the from a compliance and security perspective you're thinking about you know all the laptop data that resides within each employee's house today it used to be sitting in your office mainly but you know it's now sitting in every employee's house where you know they're working from home so how do i kind of take control of the data into a centralized server so vdi solutions again uh, you know and as you consider all these projects all these innovations and things like that you know obviously the big question is how do you fund all of that uh, and you know which is why green lake you know as a service model where there's no upfront payment becomes extremely extremely relevant okay uh, you know when i when we talk about simplifying and saving on the it resources okay having an operational console for both users and the it operations extremely important because once you have that console then there are various things that you can do with that console for example you can predict what my next month bill is going to be or my bill is going to be for the next six months you can predict when you're going to run out of IT capacity and hence when should you budget or you know if you don't want to budget you want to kind of make sure that IT can optimize those workloads uh, you know like I mentioned if you want to optimize on you know things like OPEX and things like that uh, you know that is possible uh, once you have a single operational console and so on and uh, you know all the skill gap that you could probably have in terms of as you're saving on the IT IT resource uh, and deploying all of these new technologies, these new options and so on, you know, all of those things become also extremely important. So GreenLake Central is that one dashboard which comes free of cost with every GreenLake contract. So once you sign a GreenLake, uh, you know, as a service contract for your IT infrastructure with us, then, you know, the end to end in terms of, you know, setting up that infrastructure, uh, you know, very quickly from a user and from an IT operations perspective, uh, you know, operating that, managing that, replenishing capacity and giving you all those insights and analytics. And of course, also the, you know, end of the month, we generate a bill and send it across to you, uh, very similar to a postpaid mobile phone bill or your Lexity bill in your organization, where at the end of the month, depending on how many units are consumed, accordingly, a bill is generated and sent. Okay, so that's basically uh, GreenLake, uh, you know, central at a very high level, uh, completely integrated. And at the same time, it's got excellent engines and tools built in, again, which is part of the free of cost tool, uh, where continuous compliance is an important thing you know are you running the right patches are you running the right firmwares you know if sap was released an advisory that you know you need to run on a particular security uh, patch then you know has that been applied and so on so all of that can be done through this uh, you know operational console this is an example of view of you know some of this uh, you know operational console uh, stuff uh, you know on the left of your screen on the top left uh, when you look at it as a cfo you know how much am i spending you know, predictability in these times is extremely important. So, you know, this tool and this dashboard helps you predict what your costs are today and what it could become based on the way, uh, you know, the growth your, of your infrastructure or data and things like that are happening. Uh, then again, from a, from a compliance and security perspective, the risk perspective, is my business at risk? You know, what all, uh, you know, patches, firmwares, uh, you know, security uh, advisories have been applied, not applied, so all of that. 
and all of the other ai tools that are built into the technology which is you know predictive when will i run out of the capacity you know what will i need to do to quickly run, get up uh, up and running with a new application of mine okay uh, so <clears throat> in summarization uh, green lake uh, you know is a true on prem as well as you know a kind of off prem solution so you know it's not about should i deploy within my premises or should i deploy off my premises you need to have both those options available to you at all times times okay and like i mentioned it includes you know the offerings from the public cloud providers like microsoft azure aws and with uh, google cloud we've been doing this for over 10 years okay across the world over 3 and a half billion in contracts and a very huge offering through our partners uh, technology partners some of the big four are partners like deloitte and pwc and so on and also uh, you know uh, partners around uh, you know the various uh, technologies that exist whether hyper converge with nutanix or you know other things so there's so many partners that come into play uh, as part of the green lake model so if you think this model is interesting for you then typically one would start with an evaluation of you know current deployed workloads if you have some capacity in the cloud some on prem then is it placed in the right place uh, you know should you move into this model as a consumption model what kind of be business benefits you'll get what kind of savings that you'll get in terms of your cash flow in terms of your irr in terms of your roi and things like that so that's an analysis that uh, you know our team can help with and of course the whole idea is that you know uh, using or doing away with some of your old legacy equipment uh, you know you can also use that to fund the transition using this model okay so uh, you know that is green lake for you in brief okay with that i'm going to hand over to our next speaker professor raghu ayer okay over to you professor ayer uh, thank you anurag uh, friends uh, good afternoon let me bring up my excel file <clears throat> where i just thought i'll make some very simple notes for you and let me put down what i intend to discuss and i'm quite happy to take questions at the end of uh, my very short uh, presentation uh, uh, what are the financial implications of ideas of as a solution kind let's try and explore it as uh, finance people in the current environment where in the post covid world what are we finding let's try and summarize that and try and link it to this uh, idea that we are talking about one problem is liquidity crunch the second problem is pnl uh, help the third problem is increasing risk and impact on uh, impact on beta on uh, cost of equity and ability to generate those cash flows that uh, were promised promised or planned before the covid came on these are the problems we are facing uh, friends let me start straight away with the liquidity crunch the problem in uh, india as well as the world today is many businesses are uh, disrupted on revenue if disrupted on revenue they are surely disrupted on cash costs don't go away so fast but revenues go away much faster so many companies are seriously facing a liquidity crunch i am on the board of several companies and i am also an advisor to several of them and most of our discussions are how do we survive the next year how do we survive the next two years how do we survive the next three months this is the uh, million dollar set of questions we are asking so <clears throat> everyone is seeking some kind of capex relief and nobody wants to spend on capex today that is the hard reality the health of the pnl generally speaking most of, i mean i would say 80% of clients uh, current year pnl is eroded badly very few of them it's still going on as planned i would say less than 10% and the other middle 10% are probably just looking at you know this year will break even and next year we will come back to better health um how does the world look at risk today just to give you um, a broad idea there is professor ashwatha damodaran which i'm sure many of you would have heard of and would know defines and quantifies risk on a quarterly basis <clears throat> for uh, countries around the world and uh, there are the big four for example pwc provides uh, some estimates from time to time both put together have increased risks equity risks 
by a factor of 3.5% between January to March. This is across the world. Uh, with special reference to India, we have adjusted for Indian interest rates and stuff like that. But uh, in our valuations, you see, as, as chartered accountants, we do a lot of valuations, and uh, many of them are for impairment testing for the last year. And across, uh, we have increased our cost of equity by as much as 3.5%. As all of you would be aware, incremental cost of equity will increase uh, WAC at the end of the day to a certain proportion. And that uh, will, will uh, make the business more risky. Now, when the business is more risky, one should ideally avoid uh, debt or ideally avoid uh, capex and uh, try and reduce risks as much as we can as financial people and improve valuation. This is what the holy grail of uh, valuation would teach us. I just wanted to bring to you that the average incremental cost of equity being modeled by us is 3.5% between January to March, which means if cost of equity in Jan 2020 was, say, 14%, today on an average, it's become 17.5%. Uh, <clears throat> that is what is happening in the world. Of course, then we will get into sectors and some sectors will be very high and some sectors will not be, but those are nuances. I'm not getting into that in this very generic program. Now, let me come to the idea itself. The whole idea is there is CapEx on the one hand, and there is, you know, a solution idea on the other. In solution ideas, we spend by way of OPEX and we avoid uh, CAPEX. So how does that pan out? I just want to show you a very simple illustration. I understand all of us are finance people, so we can go through it quickly. And I'll be quite happy to, you know, take any questions that you might have. But I want to present to you a very simple set of numbers. And let me start with that. Let's say that you can buy some systems today for say 100 rupees. Okay, I will email this Excel file to you at the end of the program. So you can, you can uh, kind of go through it at leisure. <clears throat> Let's say you can buy a system today for 100 rupees or you could pay 24 rupees per annum for the next five years. Which one would be cheaper? Let's ask a very simple, very basic question. And let's assume a reasonable rate of interest is 12%. Even though I've used the term rate of interest, I mean the VAT. So if that is so, then how do we work it out? I have done our classic uh, PV working in this manner. I'll take you through it. The present value factor could be 1.8929.7972, etc., which I'm dividing one by uh, 112%. And that's how these numbers are getting worked out. And uh, uh, in the case of capex, if I spend 100 rupees today, the discounted value of capex is also 100 because I'm spending on the same day. So I have 100 rupees as a benchmark number. On the other hand, if I spend 24 rupees, 24 rupees, the nominal simple total comes to 120. However, if I discount it by 112%, the discounted total comes to 86.51, which means there is a saving of 13.49 in this example or as a percentage of the capex, there is a 13.49% savings in the idea. <clears throat> now, uh, let's try and play with this and let's try and ask some more questions or maybe try and uh, challenge some of the uh, uh, propositions. The first question that we typically have customers asking us is what if in the own system or own capex plan, uh, I have the system with me after five years. Whereas in the solution plan, in the Green Lake plan, for example, the ownership is not with me. So how do we compare apples to apples? So what we do is we could value the system at the end of five years. Let's say the uh, value of the system after five years is say five rupees. Typically, 5% after five years is a reasonable number as per the experts in the industry. So if I were to modify this working, I'm just copying it down. 
if I were to modify this working, I would say, okay, I will spend uh, 100 rupees on day one in the capex, but I will probably get five rupees back. If I get five rupees back after uh, five years, then the capex plan at present value costs me 97 rupees and 16 paisa, whereas the solution plan still costs me the same 86.51. The difference between the two is still 10 rupees and 65 paisa and uh, <clears throat> as a percentage it is still 11.21 percent saving so we can kind of compare apples to apples the moment you bring in the sale value of the equipment after five years another very common uh, question that gets asked is what about uh, depreciation benefit. What about the fact that I can get depreciation benefit in capex and how do I model that? The answer to that is yes, that is true. You do get depreciation benefit in capex. In the as a solution idea, you do uh, claim the entire expense as a tax deductible expense. So you need to understand that too. So if I were to work it out, and let me quickly do it, what is the depreciation uh, benefit, say in the year one, two, three, four, five, if the opening balance of the system is 100 rupees, and the rate of depreciation is say 40%, then the depreciation that I would claim is 40 rupees in the first year the value of the system after one year will come down to 60 and applying income tax uh, written down value method of depreciation so these are the depreciation figures as per income tax and the tax benefit that i would claim let's assume a tax rate of say 30 percent then the tax benefit that i will get from capex will be so much say 12 rupees in the first year and 7.2 in the second year and so on and so on and in the as a solution model the entire amount that we pay is tax deductible and the entire amount that we pay every year is in my simple example 24 rupees so 24 rupees if i claim as a benefit then 30 percent of that is a seven rupee 20 paisa benefit that I will claim on a year on year uh, basis. So if we compare post tax numbers, how will that work out? Let's try and understand that. The capex, the tax benefit, <clears throat> the post tax capex, let's try and uh, model that. The capex numbers are, the nominal numbers of course are, say 100. And minus five. The tax benefits are these numbers. So, the post-tax capex numbers are so much. Minus here means effectively a saving. The discounted uh, value, the PV of these numbers would be 100 multiplied by the tax, uh, I'm sorry, the PV factors that we have calculated here, which is 100 and so on and so on which means after considering all the tax benefits, the net amount of cash outflow for me, if I follow the CapEx model is 75 rupees and 10 paisa. The simple outflow is 100 rupees today. I get so much of tax benefit from time to time. And I also get back the machine five rupees at the end of five years. So 75 rupees is what I'm spending. What is the post-tax as a solution uh, numbers? <clears throat> Let's try and evaluate that. Again, the simple cash flow, the pre-tax cash flow is 
24 rupees as we know that number is the same as before the tax benefit is uh, 30 percent which is 7 rupees and 20 paisa as we know so the post tax numbers are this minus this 16 rupees 80 paisa and the pv of these numbers would be 16 rupees 80 paisa multiplied by the present value factors of whatever we had earlier and that comes to something like 60 rupees and uh, 56 paisa so the point i'm trying to make is if you consider tax benefits in both the situations in the capex you claim depreciation here you claim the tax benefit of the expense there is still a saving in the as a solution model the saving here is something like 14 rupees and 54 paisa and the saving as a percentage of the capex pv is still pretty interesting at 19 percent or so so typically you find the savings are fairly high we are not even bringing in the fact that uh, uh, there is a capacity saving etc the green lake proposition if i convert it into a finance person's uh, layman's language the green lake proposition provides that HPE will um, include a buffer element of capex so if you need uh, you need 10 tons maybe 12 tons are sitting there and a buffer of two tons is available so that you can always use it if you don't use those two tons you are not billed for it that I think is a simple uh, proposition there. I'm not even considering all that there. If I include all of that, then the savings percentage goes up even uh, higher. Now there might be uh, people who might say, some of you might say, oh, my cost of funds is not uh, 12%. It is something else, maybe higher, maybe lower. Here, I want to make a conceptual point first, and then we can make a mathematical point also. The conceptual point is that uh, uh, one should consider the VAC for such decisions. What I'm trying to say is, if you can borrow uh, at uh, cheap rates, okay, say 8%, is 8% the right discounting factor? This question uh, does torment many of us. And the academic and professional answer <clears throat> is no. You should consider your VAC. And uh, VAC brings in cost of equity. Cost of equity brings in beta and equity risk premium, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, most companies, VAC is in the range of 13% or more. And as I was telling you, post-COVID, this has only risen, not fallen. Even though, this is important, even though uh, rates of interest might have fallen, and for some, they say, no, it has not fallen in the banks, you know, all this 20 lakh crore benefits that we are talking about is not really happening at the grassroots level and getting a loan is not as easy as it looks or the rates of interest are still not very clear or not very specified etc so that's a different uh, discussion but the point is that if you consider the WAC the WAC is certainly not in the range of eight percent or so <clears throat> unless you are uh, geo platforms in which case uh, the story may be different but not all of us are geo platforms as all of us would uh, agree so let me do a very simple sensitivity analysis of what happens if the, the, the cost of funds is not 12%, but it is something else. So supposing it is 11%, 12%, 13%, 14%.
then what is happening to our uh, percentage savings that we have computed here? So we have computed here, for example, in the first simple case, the saving is 13.49. If I bring in the fact that uh, the asset remains with you after five years, the savings is 11.21. If I bring in the fact that there are tax savings, then the savings are 19.37. So if I bring in all that, and then I compare the uh, change in these savings percentages, if the cost of funds were to change, then what are the numbers? And the numbers are like this. Uh, point that we are trying to make is in all those cases, you know, these are the savings in as a solution over capex and this is the uh, vac if the vac is 12 percent you know the base case that i have considered anyway i'm, I'm marking that green for ease of uh, vision <clears throat> if the cost of fund is 12 percent then as a solution is better by 13 percent 11 percent 19 percent if the cost of fund is lower it is lower if the cost of fund is higher, if it is 13 or 14, then the savings are even higher and higher. Some of you might say, oh, my cost of fund is only 10%. Okay. Even then, the other solution is better. If your cost of fund is only 9%, even then, the uh, other solution is better. That's the way it tends to go. I'm not, I'm not claiming that these are actual numbers. I'm just saying this is the way thinking should happen. We do have actual numbers also and those use cases are available, which the HP people can surely discuss with you. I'm just giving you my thoughts on how uh, sensitivity works. Now, some of us may have a lower or higher tax rate. I have considered 30% in the basic working, but if it is not 30%, if it is something else, again, let us see what happens here. Maybe if the tax rate is 30% in the base case and 28%, 26%, 24%, even 10%, because some of uh, com companies might make losses, then the tax rate obviously may not be very relevant also. But in that case, what happens? Let me create a, a table for that. So I'm just uh, pulling the tax rate from here. So what are we finding? The base case is here, 30% base case. I'm marking that green again for ease of uh, identification. <clears throat> the first two columns are not changing at all and they should not change because I have not even considered tax rate in the first two columns. They were before, before tax, but the third one is the one after tax and you can find that if the tax rate is 30%, then your saving is 19%. As tax rate goes lower and lower and lower, the savings also goes lower and lower. But even if you pay tax at nearly 10%, even then there is a saving of 13.3% in the as a solution idea over uh, capex so that i think is the uh, positive positive about uh, the other solution uh, idea uh, friends as i told you we have worked it out in several ways we have actual models taking absolutely the capacities of clients and what kind of uh, uh, Charges will apply if you go for Green Lake and what would the system cost, including GST, including the fact that more capex might be incurred in times to come, etc. And consistently, we find that the Green Lake idea generates a lot of savings. This pre-COVID world where capex was not such a major constraint, but today that has also become a constraint. So, if you were to add, you were required to add more systems in the coming five years. Capex, which is chunky, will eat into your 
cash flows and the amounts will be large whereas green lake uh, incremental cash outflows <coughs> would be much much smaller and probably much smoother than the capex uh, idea so if we model all that for example here i assume that in 3 years you will add more 50% more systems etc i can assure you that these savings that i have plotted here will be much more maybe even double of whatever we have plotted here i'm talking from some experience in that uh, in that uh, space so friends i think uh, this is what i wanted to uh, communicate and i will now hand over the proceedings to uh, seema and uh, we will await questions from you and i'm happy to answer any questions that you may have thank you so much uh, anurag mr tanija and raghu for those uh, wonderful insights uh, may i request everyone to sort of type in their questions into the q and a window uh, so that we can take them up uh, you know towards the end of the schedule uh, but, so while people are sort of Uh, putting in their questions, we'd like to run a very quick poll, and you will have this come up on your screen now. So please do key in your responses as well. This is thirty seconds. So um, it says, please examine if the life of the equipment is more than five years. What could be the scenario, uh, Professor Raghu? Would you want to take that? Uh, yes, if the life is more than uh, five years, it will still not matter because in those cases the lease rentals will also come down. So even if it goes to seven years, but my experience is from the IT industry experts that the life uh, is not all that much because mm -hmm. even if the equipment works well, unfortunately technology keeps changing quite uh, rapidly, and therefore the lives are in fact even shorter than five years. but from a financial point of view it will not matter because the rentals will then not be 24 rupees the rentals might be lower and therefore we will not find a major issue sure i think uh, you know following up on the same question um, uh, you know there's another one which says at what point uh, of assumptions is there a break even how uh, we can work out the break evens at uh, <clears throat> at several uh, levels mm -hmm. so you know uh, if the 24 were to become let us say 22 or something maybe there is a break even that depends on the actual facts of each case but uh, roughly that is what tends to happen if the 24 becomes like 20 21 again depends on whether you are uh, considering post tax or pre tax 5 years or 3 years or 4 years so surely there is a break even if the uh, price levels come down drastically maybe 10% 15% then that break even or what i might call as a point of indifference uh, comes in at those levels uh, and that my next question is to you you know when we ran this poll there were about 44% which actually said that uh, they've still not considered this option so you know when you approach prospective clients uh, what are some of the um, uh, you know some of the arguments that you that you face i mean it just be helpful to try and understand if the thinking is even across uh, Actually, organizations <laughs> Okay, thanks, Ima. So, uh, you know, I have a couple of points uh, before on the question that were asked. Mm -hmm. so one, one is the financial analysis part of it, but other is that the propensity to refresh equipments within four to five years is extremely high when you're not tied down by a useful life, when you're not compelled to depreciate. So, in the Green Lake model, customers don't have the title or the ownership of the goods. Okay. so uh, you know uh, the propensity is to refresh faster and one of the reasons for that is that in about 4 to 5 years one would get about double the capacity or double the performance for the same price so why should i live with old equipment unless you know i have some legacy data sitting on it or things like that so the thinking changes very dramatically when one starts considering a as a service model okay Uh, coming back to your question uh, you know one of the things that we've seen as most customers not even aware that on premise as a service is a possibility 
Okay. Second one is the tendency is either to compare it with CapEx. And I think Professor Iyer spent the last 15, 20 minutes explaining very compelling, in a very compelling manner of why, you know, this makes sense. But also, you know, customers sometimes get blinded uh, by, you know, a lot of uh, options that are sitting on the table, like, you know, public cloud or co-location and, you know, those kind of things. Okay. They're all very interesting offers. They're all very interesting propositions. And hence, uh, you know, we find those kind of uh, questions also coming up uh, but like the good part uh, like I was mentioning in my presentation was that the fact that you know people can uh, you know don't need to get binded to capacity in one location with the Green Lake model you can continue to have the best of all the worlds okay whether it is on premise whether it is in the public cloud through the same contract so a lot of times customers ask me this question uh, you know why should I consider Green Lake I can directly go to an AWS or Microsoft Azure well you know three four reasons for that first is a a single contract to administer. Second one is a single invoice to process at the end of the month. The third one is that, you know, when there's a support issue, okay, typically you don't want to deal with multiple vendors, okay. And the last one is in the Green Lake model, like uh, Professor Iyer explained, uh, you know, the, the, the capacity is kind of, uh, or the billing can be uh, in a very predictable fa fashion, you know, whatever is the you know, minimum bill versus what the, versus the installed capacity. So, you know, these are some of the things that, you know, when we start discussing with customers, uh, you know, and we start, hop, uh, you know, kind of looking at these points, that's when customers realize and, you know, that that's when it gets you no know, pretty serious discussion in terms of the analysis. Well, wow, thanks so much, because that's just sort of helps summarize the whole discussion very quickly. Uh, I do see one more question. Uh, it says, what's the lead time in getting hardware on premise for an urgent project requirement in Green Lake than in CapEx buying? So uh, typically, uh, you know, one can do the project within about three to four weeks. You know, that is mm -hmm. a possibility. Uh, but depending on the urgency, depending on the size of the project, depending on availability, I think post COVID and all of us saw during the last three months, there was a lot of stress on supply chains and things like that. Uh, you know, the, the thing that everybody needs to understand is in the Green Lake model, I'm not getting any money up front. So the faster I deploy, the faster we can go live, uh, you know, it di directly impacts my revenue too. So our attempt is to get it in front of the customers. If we can do it in two weeks, that's, uh, you know, great. But typically uh, a lot of of equipment comes in from the Singapore factory. So it takes about three to four weeks. Okay. okay. So I think that was a good interaction. And what we will also do is we will share the coordinates of all our uh, speakers uh, today. And, uh, you know, I'm sure participants will have a lot of questions that they can write back. I think they're still assimilating Professor Raghu's, uh, um, you know, Excel sheet and trying to make sense out of it. So I'm sure that you will get a lot of responses. So just to sort of sum up very quickly, um, you know, agility will be the key to surviving this crisis as we all know, and therefore having capacity at the ready will enable companies to move faster and ready themselves for a revival. So with that, I would like to end this webinar. A big thank you to all our speakers and a wonderful audience. And like I said, we will share the coordinates of all our uh, speakers with the audience and they can write back to uh, you if they need any clarification. So thank you all very much for being here. And I hope you found the session valuable. Thank you.